This is a significant distinction, but one which may not wholly reassure many Americans. So I need to talk about this quote from Christopher Pyle's Army Surveillance of Civilians, a documentary analysis in 1973. Its intentions are sociopathic, are murderous, are killer, are disgusting. Thus, states like China or, quote, Russia or Iran, they don't have these same intentions. Therefore, when we stand for the abolition of Western intelligence apparatuses, it is because their intentions are wholly, or wholly evil and are completely, utterly opposite to those of other nations. As such, we don't have to talk about those other nations. And by teaching people the history of the CIA, MI5, MI6, CSIS, and so on and so forth, you will give people the understanding they need to say, yeah, no, I'm on the same page as you. Because all it takes is teaching them the history and telling them nothing's changed because these people took advantage of, quote, nine, uh, took advantage of 9-11 and the terrorist attacks of that era to build a security apparatus that gives them a global Phoenix program. And people can see it. People aren't stupid. People see it. What they lack is the ability to connect the dots in the right order to see what's going on. This is how conspiracy theorists are born is everyone can see the dots, but not everyone can connect the dots. And some people don't even have the time to connect the dots. And those who do have the time oftentimes will sometimes get it wrong, especially if they don't have material dialectic or historical dialectic. These two things provide you with the tools to connect the dots in the right order so you don't make mistakes and end up down the wrong rabbit hole. Early Monday morning, October 1st, 1962, a man named J.C.R. Licklider woke up in an apartment along the Potomac River across from the White House. He ate breakfast, said goodbye to his wife and daughters, and drove the short way to the Pentagon to start his new job as director of ARPA's Behavioral Science and Command and Control Research Divisions. Oh! Robo Gaming, I don't know if you know any of this, but um, I can't remember the specifics, but let me get y'all the link for CIA as uh, organized crime because it's in there. Um, not only was it a gift in this sense, but four years or so, roughly four or so years prior to 9-11 happening, there was a government agency tasked with figuring out what would happen if a terrorist attack took out certain things in America or caused certain things to destabilize in America. And this agency came to the conclusion that what they needed to do was create basically the Department of Homeland Security and institute a global Phoenix program. And the person who headed the organization, the agency at the time of this plan's creation, was Rob Simmons. Rob Simmons was a CIA agent as part in, involved with, a large part involved with, the Phoenix program in Vietnam. He was then brought back into the fold in the 90s to work at certain government agencies. And then in the 2000s, he was put into Congress as a legislator to help create and then pass the Intelligence Identities Protection Act, which is the law that has since banned the ability to publish names or even suggest close to what the methods of the CIA might be. The only person they've ever prosecuted under this law was the person who leaked the information that the United States was lying that there were WMDs in Iraq. So, 
CIA's got its fingerprints over everything here. Yes. So not only was it a, um, I think actually PNAC was maybe the, hold on, hold on, let me look at this up. It might have been this. Does Rob Simmons' names show up here? No, it's not. It doesn't show his job that he held, but it's in the book. It's in the chapter on Rob Simmons. Rob Simmons gets his own little um, chapter to talk about this, to discuss this. Anyway. Back to our reading. But yes, what you said is true. Settling into his modest office, he surveyed the scene. The past few years, those in defense circles had pushed to upgrade America's military intelligence communication systems. As soon as he came into office, President Kennedy had complained about the difficulty of effectively exercising command of U.S. military forces. He found himself blind and deaf at the most crucial moments, unable to get real-time intelligence updates or to communicate timely commands to commanders in the field. Believing that military commanders were using the outdated technology as cover to buck his authority and ignore instructions, he pushed Defense Secretary Robert McNamara to investigate solutions. He also harangued Congress about the need to develop, quote, a truly unified national, nationwide indestructible system to ensure high level command, communication, and control. Licklider agreed. America's defense communication systems were indeed pathetically outdated. They simply could not effectively respond to the challenges of the day. Dozens of small-scale wars and insurgencies happening in distant places no one knew a damn thing about. All that combined with the ever-present threat of nuclear strikes that could decapitate huge chunks of military command. But what exactly would such a new system look like? What components would it have? What new technologies needed to be invented for it to work? Few people in the Pentagon knew the answers. Licklider was one of the few. Joseph Carl Robnett Licklider, a ridiculously long name, was simply called Lick. He wore Coke bottle glasses and three-piece suits and was known for his Coca-Cola addiction. In rarefied military circles, Lick had a reputation as a brilliant psychologist and a computer futurist with some far-out ideas about the coming age of the man-machine. important facts because this kind of persona is I, I talk about this and i'm not the only one who talks about this but this kind of personality this kind of type is the norm in these circles now because in order to do the things that the empire needs you to do you tend to be not only an oddball but this oddball behavior is a way to cover the sociopathic tendencies underneath. Because if they're not a sociopath, they can't really do what they're doing forever. That's what Havana Syndrome is all about. And as Douglas Valentine has said, the reason Havana Syndrome is so rare to show up these days is because the rank and file have been quite readily vetted and ensured that they're all good little zealots for the cause.
He was born in 1915 in St. Louis, Missouri. His father, a Baptist minister and the head of the St. Louis Chamber of Commerce, was a God-fearing, business-oriented man. Lick made his dad proud. In 1937, he graduated from Washington University in St. Louis with a triple major in psychology, mathematics, and physics, and then moved on to study how animals processed sound, which mostly involved slicing cats' skulls open and zapping their brains with electricity. During World War II, Lick was recruited to work at Harvard's Psychoacoustic Laboratory, which was established with lavish funding from the U.S. Air Force to study human speech, hearing, and communication. At this lab, he met his future wife, Louise Thomas, who worked as a secretary in a military research center. She considered herself a socialist and even brought her copy of Socialist Worker to the office. She'd leave it on the edge of her desk so that the men in the lab could grab it on the way to the bathroom and have something to read while they were on the can. After the war, Lick left Harvard for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. There, he came into contact with the world's first networked digital computer surveillance system. It changed the trajectory of his life. White lady styling herself as a socialist and doing nothing more than reading socialist rags that aren't even real socialist rags. Oh no. It's great. The settler colonial mentality, y'all. Soviet nukes. At precisely 7 a.m. on August 29, 1949, engineers sitting in a fortified bunker on an isolated steps uh, on the isolated steps of the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic threw a switch and detonated the first Soviet nuclear bomb. First lightning, codenamed RDS-1. The bomb was set up on a wooden tower surrounded by mock buildings and industrial and military machinery trucked there to test the effects of the blast. A T-34 tank, brick buildings, a metal bridge, a small section of a railroad complete with railroad cars, automobiles, trucks, field artillery, and airplane, and over a thousand different live animals, dogs, rats, pigs, sheep, guinea pigs, and rabbits tied down in trenches, behind walls, and inside vehicles. It was a fairly small bomb, around the size of the one dropped on Nagasaki. In fact, it was almost a one-to-one -one replica of Fat Man, as that bomb was known. Before and after photos of the site showed heavy damage. Many of the animals died instantly. Those that didn't were badly burned and died of radiation exposure. Lavrenti Beria, the notorious NKVD People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, a Soviet secret police organization, chief, was there to observe. He cabled Stalin. The test was a success. News of the explosion threw America's military establishment into a panicked frenzy. U.S. nuclear dominance was no more. The Soviet Union now had the capability to launch a nuclear strike against the United States. All it needed was a long-range bomber. This posed serious problems. America's early warning radar system was sparse and full of holes. The process of tracking airplanes was done by hand. Uniformed military men sitting in dark rooms filled with cigarette smoke, watching primitive green radar screens barking out coordinates and jotting them down on glass boards, and then radioing commands to pilots. The system would be useless in the face of a large, targeted nuclear attack by air. A report of a special body convened by the U.S. Air Force convene recommended that the early warning radar system be automated. Radar information should be digitized, sent over wires, and processed in real time by computers. In 1950, this recommendation was more than just ambitious. It was a crackpot idea. MIT professor George Valley, who headed the Air Force study, asked several computer companies if they would be able to build such a real-time computer system. He was laughed out of the room. The technology for real-time data processing, especially for multiple radar installations that were hundreds of miles away from the central computer, just did not exist. Nothing even came close. We pause here for a second. This is done about some of the technologies that I've talked about or some of the things that people believe are impossible, like space colonization in time before climate change and things like that. 
every time people do this they underestimate and show their ignorance of the history all right all right y'all see what i'm saying here they're ignorant of the history here 80 years ago they were laughed out of offices and businesses and research institutes trying to build this and talk about this and then not even 15 years later they have the first iterations of it being deployed for covert operations in vietnam and southeast asia and then elsewhere and then by the 80s they have developed it into a public internet platform and then by the 90s it's taking over the world by the 2000s it's taken over the world and by 2021 2022 every goddamn person in the world pretty much is on the internet or at least in part will find a way to have some section of time on the internet being on the internet is an important facet of the modern world there are african countries seeking to use the digital space the internet to help boost their ability to develop their nation's industry and therefore quality of life for their people an interesting interesting topic If the Air Force wanted an automated radar system, it would have to invent a computer powerful enough to handle the job. Luckily, the Pentagon was already a prime mover and shaker in this field. During World War II, the U.S. military played a leading role in advancing the primitive state of digital computer technology. The reasons for this were many, and all of them central to the war effort. One was cryptography. The Navy's intelligence division, as well as several other pre predecessor agencies to the National Security Agency, had long used specialized IBM punch card tabulators to perform cryptographic analysis and code breaking. During the war, they were faced with advanced Nazi encryption techniques and needed machines that could work faster with much more complicated code. Digital computers were the only thing that could get the job done. Thank you, Alan Turing. Other services were also desperate for machines that could carry out mathematical calculations at high speeds, but for a slightly different reason. During the war, powerful new cannons and field artillery rolled off production lines and headed out to the European and Pacific theaters. All this firepower was useless if it couldn't be properly aimed. Artillery, big guns that can hit targets a dozen miles away, don't shoot in a straight trajectory but lob shells at a slight angle so that they descend on far off targets after tracing a parabolic arc. Each gun has a firing table that specifies the angle at which the fire shells so or fire so shells hit their mark. Firing tables aren't simple, one page sheets but thick booklets with hundreds of variables in the equations. The 155 millimeter Long Tom Field Cannon, one of the most popular big guns used during World War II, incorporates 500 variables in its firing table. Air temperature, gunpowder temperature, elevation, humidity, wind speed, and direction, and even soil type are all important environmental factors required in the complex calculations. My friends, war is not as simple as you have been led to believe. War is not as simple as you have been led to believe, and I apologize that you have been led down that ignorant path to believe that this thing, this horrible thing that is war, was some kind of click button kind of thing. The people involved in it, there are many reasons that there are so many people involved in these things. There's so much, there's reasons that the soldier class as a concept, as an idea of a class, can even exist. This is labor. I'll bet labor for the purposes of imperialism, but you also have to realize that in order to counter imperialist militarism, you have to build your own military. So, 
it starts to paint a picture for what it might be like to be in a revolutionary army. Not surprisingly, these charts were treacherous to calculate. All the variables and hundreds of permutations had to be plugged in and worked out by hand. Mistakes regularly crept in and calculations restarted from scratch. Just one firing table for one type of gun could take more than a month to complete. And there were surprises. The army discovered that tables calculated to work in Europe didn't work in Africa because the soil variables were different. Though the guns were delivered, they were a little more than dead weight until the firing data could be recalculated from scratch. Squads of clerks, usually women, worked around the clock using pen, paper, and mechanical adding aids to crunch the numbers. These women were called computers before digital computers existed, and they were incredibly important to the war effort. This is that civilian side of the war that I talk about. The civilian side clerics still exist. They still exist as part of the recruiting system. They still exist as part of um, the creation of arms, the moving of arms and munitions. Like, the U.S. Army moves its new tanks along civilian railways with civilian trains. They move them through Memphis and other stops along the train lines. So the civilian jobs that weren't automatable are still being year run, but these kind of jobs like being the quote unquote computer, those got automated pretty quick. Now they're trying to still automate even more jobs, but they're not trying to automate every job. The way in which they're trying to automate jobs is this. Right now, their intelligence systems, and Yasha Levine is gonna get into it, so this is a little bit of a spoiler. But right now, their intelligence systems operate on collecting all the data from the digital systems. Receipt data, digital conversation data, text messages, pictures, yada, yada, yada. All of it is gathered and stored. But it's stored in a giant database that's unorganized at first. That's its first stop. Just to be stored till it's organized. Then it has to be organized. The problem is, is you can't really automate the organization of it yet because programs to do that, the, the, the AI software isn't as smart as it needs to be to do that accurately. The error percentage is too high with the amount of data. You're talking about billions of terabytes of data. That means that when you have, say, a 20% error rate with a sample size of like 100,000 bytes that's not a, of bytes of data, that's not a big deal. But when you take that 100,000 bytes and turn it into um, like 1 billion terabytes, which is a huge number and I can't really calculate it any other way for you, that's a larger amount of data that becomes erroneously organized. And that's a huge issue for an intelligence system, right? So right now, most of the organization is done by human hands, hands like mine. One of the jobs my MOS was tasked with at the lowest levels, the enlisted ranks, the ranks I was in, was to organize all of that intelligence data through creating algorithms, checking our algorithms, doing it manually sometimes to teach the algorithms and the like, and you would work in teams. There would be like 40 of us in a team, 40 of us to a room with like three, two to three sergeants or whatever. We would all be reporting to a couple lieutenants, and those lieutenants would have a captain. That's the chain of command. Our job would be to take information and just plug and chug it all day six days a week 52 weeks out of the year that was it and they do not have enough people to fill these roles it's not just the army it's not just the navy it's not just the air force nsa has people doing this cia has people doing this dea has people doing this fbi has people doing this and all of these organizations all of these bureaucratic agencies of the united states military 
don't have enough people to sift through and organize all the data they're getting. That's how much data they're getting. They've got a lot of people in these roles because they pay good. It's good pay. It's good money. It's a cushy, cushy job. And you're set for jobs in the private sector right after because you're coming out of this job with one of the highest security clearances you can get paid for by the US military so every private company wants you because they don't have to invest half a million dollars into you just to get you the security clearance you come with it and not only do you come with it you come with a bunch of connections oodles of experience that they love to use and ta-da you get a six-figure salary right out the gate cushy ain't it Silver, why didn't you take it? Because I'm a goddamn anti-imperialist, motherfuckers. Mm. Also, I got hurt. Leave me alone. Regardless, back to our reading so we can continue understanding this shit. Firing tables were of such vital significance that both the Navy and the Army funded separate efforts to, fund, to build automated calculators, all in the service of aiming giant killing machines, and helped develop the first digital computers in the process. Most notably among them was the ENIAC, built for the Army by a team of mathematicians and engineers at the University of Pennsylvania's Moore School of Electrical Engineering. The computer was an instant sensation. Doo doo doo. Robot calcula calculator knocks out figures like chain lightning, declared a newspaper headline in 1948 in an article reporting the unveiling of the ENIAC. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The War Department tonight unveiled the world's fastest calculating machine and said the robot possibly opened the mathematical way to better living for every man. Improved industrial products, better communication and in transportation, superior weather forecasting, and other advances in science and engineering may be made possible, the Army said from the development of the first all-electronic general-purpose computer. The Army described the machine as a thousand times faster than the most advanced calculating machine previously built and declared the apparatus makes it possible to solve in hours problems which would take years on any other machine does everything the machine which can add subtract multiply divide and compute square root as well as do most complex calculations based on those operations is called the ENIAC short for electronic numerical integrator and computer it also has been nicknamed the mechanical Einstein the ENIAC didn't come fast enough to help with the war, but it stayed in operation for nearly a decade, crunching firing tables, running atomic bomb calculations, and building weather models of the Soviet climate, including mapping the potential spread of fallout from a nuclear war. As powerful as the ENIAC, as powerful as it was, the ENIAC wasn't enough. To develop the computer and networking technology necessary to power a modern radar defense system, a special research division known as the Lincoln Laboratory was created. Attached to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and based out of a research campus 10 miles east of Cambridge, the Lincoln Lab was a joint project of the Navy, Air Force, Army, and IBM. Its sole objective was to build a modern air defense system. An astounding number of resources were thrown at the effort. Thousands of civilian contractors and military personnel were involved over a 10-year period. The software itself took about a thousand man-years to program. The entire project, more than the Manhattan Project, the effort to develop the first atomic weapon.
let me explain what a thousand man years means that means that if you took all of the labor of each individual person that worked on the project and you added them together to create a cumulative total you are creating a thousand man years So the thousands of civilian contractors and military personnel who put their labor hours towards this project, cumulatively combined, those labor hours, you get about a thousand years. That's a lot of labor. That's a lot of labor. The Lincoln Lab assembled a monster, the semi-automatic ground environment, or SAGE. It was the biggest computer system in history and the first real computer network. SAGE was controlled by two dozen direction centers located strategically around the country. These giant nuclear-proof concrete bunkers housed two IBM computers that together cost $4 billion in today's dollars, weighed 600 tons, and took up an acre of floor space. One was always on standby in case the other failed. Each control center employed hundreds of people and was connected to land-based and coastal radar arrays, missile silos, and nearby interceptor aircraft bases. The system could track up to 400 airplanes in real time, scramble fighter jets, launch Nike missiles, and aim anti-aircraft cannons. SAGE was the eyes ears and brains of a massive weapon it was the first nationwide computerized surveillance machine surveillance in the broader sense a system that collected information from remote sensors analyzed it and allowed the military to act on the intelligence it produced Sage was an incredibly sophisticated machine, but in practice it was outdated before it was ever turned on. It went online in the early 1960s, more than three years after the Soviet Union had launched the Sputnik, and thereby demonstrated its long-range intercontinental missiles capability. The Soviets could shoot a nuclear payload into space and have it come down anywhere in the United States, and no fancy radar system could do anything about it. On the surface, Sage was a boondoggle, but in a bigger historical sense, it was a phenomenal success. MIT Lincoln Laboratory, with its top-notch engineering talent and near limitless resources directed at a narrow set of problems, became more than just a research and development center for a single military project. It turned into a training ground for a new engineering elite a multidisciplinary group of scientists, academics, government officials, businessmen, and mathematicians who would go on to create the modern computer industry and build the internet. The addition of new elites into the ruling class over which who presided over the soldier class as well as empire as a whole do 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 And J.C.R. Licklider was at the center of it all. At the Lincoln Laboratory, he worked on the human side of this vast radar computer system and helped develop the system's graphic display, which had to integrate data from multiple radars and to display real-time heading and speed information that could then be used to guide aircraft interceptors. It was a small but vital component of SAGE, and the work opened his eyes to the possibilities of building tools that integrated people and computers into one continuous system. A man machine that broke through human physical limitations and created new powerful hybrid beings. Cyborgs and cybernetics. 
The Massachusetts Institute of Technology was ground zero for a new science called cybernetics. Developed by MIT professor Norbert Weiner, cybernetics defined the world as a giant computational machine. It offered a conceptual and mathematical framework for thinking about and designing complex information systems. Weiner was an odd and brilliant man. He was short, pudgy, with a meaty round head and thick glasses. In his later years, he looked a bit like Hans Molman from The Simpsons. He was also a true wonder kind. The son of a strict and ambitious academic and Slavic scholar, Weiner was forced to memorize entire books and recite them from memory and to perform complex algebra and trigonometry in his head. My father would be doing his homework for Harvard and I had to stand beside him and recite my lessons by memory, even in Greek, at six years old, and he would ignore me until I made the simplest mistake, then he would verbally reduce me to dust, he recalled in his autobiography. With this kind of training, Weiner went to college at the age of 11, the infant prodigy of Boston, one newspaper called him, and earned a PhD in mathematics by age 18 and rejected from a job at Harvard, started teaching at MIT. His life of frantic study and pitiless criticism from his father didn't prepare him for the social dimension of life. He was clumsy, couldn't talk to women, had few true friends, was depressive, and could barely take care of himself. His parents arranged his marriage to Ra Margaret Engman, an immigrant from Germany who had had trouble finding a husband. They had two normal daughters and the marriage seemed fine except for one little detail. Margaret was a steadfast supporter of Adolf Hitler and forced their daughters to read Mein Kampf. One day, she told us that the members of her family in Germany had been certified as Judenrein, free of Jewish taint. She thought we'd be pleased to know, recalled her daughter. She said, I should not feel sorry for the Jews of Germany because they were not very nice people. During a Christmas party, she tried to convince guests that Aryan lineage stretched back to the Son of God himself. Jesus was the son of a German mercenary stationed in Jerusalem, and this had been scientifically proven. It was an awkward situation given that her husband was a Jew of German descent and her daughters were thereby half Jewish. But this was no ordinary household. Not just an incel soxy. They created a good little scientist. That's what they created, a good little scientist. And then they married him to a Nazi so that that would always be as part of this thing. The Nazis were involved in this from the very beginning. Woo! Weiner's mind was perpetually hungry, devouring everything in its past. He crossed just about every disciplinary boundary, cutting through philosophy, mathematics, engineering, linguistics, physics, psychology, evolutionary biology, neurobiology, and computer science. During World War II, Weiner met a problem that tested the limits of his brilliant multidisciplinary multi brain. He was recruited to work on a quixotic, top-secret venture to build an automatic aiming targeting mechanism that could increase the effectiveness of ground-to-air anti-aircraft cannons. All through the war, he worked on a specialized computer apparatus that used microwave radar to watch, pinpoint, and then predict a plane's future position on the basis of its pilot's actions in order to more effectively blast it out of the sky. It was a machine that studied the actions of a human being and responded dynamically to them. While building it, he had a profound insight about the nature of information. He began to see that the communication of information wasn't just an abstract or ephemeral act, but had a powerful physical property to it. Like an invisible force, it could be relied on to trigger a reaction. He also made another simple but profound leap. He realized that communication and transmission of messages were not limited to humans, but pervaded all living organisms and could be designed into the mechanical world as well. Um, I want to shout out that this is just stolen um, indigenous knowledge. Man's just realizing what the indigenous people tried to teach colonizers hundreds of years ago. And I'm just sitting here going, resident sleeper. But we must not derail too far down that road. That would get us off topic too much. Weiner published these ideas in a dense 1948 tract called Cybernetics, Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. 
What was cybernetics? The concept was slipperily, slippery and maddeningly difficult to define. In simple terms, he described cybernetics as the idea that the biological nervous system and the computer or automatic machine were basically the same thing. They were, quote, devices which make decisions on the basis of decisions they have made in the past, he explained. To Weiner, people and the entire living world could be seen as one giant interlocking information machine, everything responding to everything else in an intricate system of cause, effect, and feedback. He predicted that our lives would increasingly be mediated and enhanced by computers and integrated to the point that there would cease to be any difference between us and the larger cybernetic machine in which we lived. Despite being full of incomprehensible mathematical proofs and jargon, the book excited the public's imagination and became an instant bestseller. Military circles received it as a revolutionary work as well. What Karl Marx's Das Kapital did for 19th century socialists, Weiner Cybernetics did for the American anti-communist cold warriors. On a very basic level, cybernetics posited that human beings, like all living things, were information processing machines. We were all computers, highly complex, but computers nonetheless. That meant that the military could, could could construct machines that could think like people and act like people, scan for enemy planes and ships, transcribe enemy radio trans communications, spy on subversives, analyze foreign news for hidden meaning and secret messages, all without needing sleep or food or rest. With computer technology like this, America's dominance was guaranteed. Cybernetics triggered an elusive decades-long quest by the military to fulfill this particular vision of cybernetics, an effort to create computers with what we now call artificial intelligence. Divorced from its actual roots and divorced from the concepts of stewardship, Notice how computers become nothing more than emotionless, apathetic. They can't have a connection. And therefore, we, in turn, lose our connection to the land. And as such, we think of ourselves as separate from the land, from the earth. Uh-oh, SpaghettiO. It's bad, y'all. It's bad. Cybernetic concepts, backed by huge amounts of military funding, began to pervade academic disciplines. Economics, engineering, psychology, political science, biology, environmental studies. Neoclassical economists integrated cybernetics into their theories and began looking at markets as distributed information machines. Ecologists began looking, began to look at the Earth itself as a self-regulating computational biosystem, and cognitive psychologists and cognitive scientists approached the study of the human brain as if it were literally a complex digital computer. Political scientists and sociologists began to dream of using cybernetics to create a controlled utopian society, a perfectly well-oiled system where computers and people were integrated into a cohesive whole, managed and controlled to ensure security and prosperity. Put more, put most clearly, in the 1950s, both the U.S. military, both the military and the U.S. industry explicitly advocated a messianic understanding of computing in which computation was the underlying matter of everything in the social world and could therefore be brought under state capitalist military control, centralized hierarchical control, writes historian David Columbia in The Cultural Logic of Computation, a groundbreaking study of computational ideology. In a big way, this intermeshing of cybernetics and big power was what caused Norbert Weiner to turn against cybernetics almost as soon as he introduced it to the world. He saw scientists and military men ta taking the narrowest possible interpretation of cybernetics to create better killing machines and more efficient systems of surveillance and control and exploitation. He saw giant corporations using his ideas to automate production and cut labor in their quest for greater wealth and economic power. He began to see that in a society mediated by computer and information systems, those who controlled the infrastructure wielded ultimate power. Ooh, 
Oh, that's a banger. He had an Oppenheimer moment, y'all. Oopsies. Don't you think it's ironic how Oppenheimer and Weiner both had their, like, good God, what have we done moments? Oppenheimer with the nuclear bomb, Weiner with cybernetics. <laughs> it's impressive, really. Impressive, really, how the military constantly does this to its most famous researchers. <laughs> Doesn't really happen anymore today because they're all goody goody two shoe good boys of empire. I mean, look at Elon Musk, look at Bill Gates, look at Bobby Kotick. I mean, for those of you who are looking at the Microsoft deal with Activision Blizzard, they were more. Uh, they, uh, if Microsoft had said no, they were going to ask Metaverse to buy them. And I'm just sitting here wondering when people are going to start paying me my dues for being right about everything that's coming. We're all going to be living under the hegemony of a corporation in mega cities, and those who don't get to live in the mega cities will either have to find their way to being drafted into the war efforts, or drafted into the space colonization efforts, or they're going to be left out in the Mad Max world that exists around, or the water world that exists either one i don't know i don't know whether we're going to have a flooded world or if all the water is just going to start to evaporate because of like fire and acid rain and shit you know you, you never know what's going to happen it's all kinds of bad though y'all i mean we've looked at the map of what happens when you reduce the amount of water and when you raise sea levels Well, first, Robo, we have to build the space stations and set up the um, ports to build ships in space so that we can save on fuel so that it becomes actually economical to um, mine asteroids and the like. Because right now, it's just not feasible to send people onto mine asteroids and the like with where we're at simply because getting into space from Earth is really hard. And it's not so much that the tech isn't in place. We have the technology, y'all. It's the infrastructure. We must divorce our thinking now. It's not a lack of technology. We have the ability to build a spaceport. It is a lack of infrastructure. During the 60s and the 50s, it was a lack of technology, as Yasha Levine is pointing out. But they quickly overcame the technological problem, and now it's an infrastructure problem. We've talked about this before, and there's a video I'll show at the end of this chapter. But basically, there's two issues. There's the tech. They got to keep advancing the technology, the knowledge the applicable tech, and then they have to put it into infrastructure. You have to build the things. Your spaceports, your factories, your ships, your tanks and stuff. And a lot of people, and this happens in the liberal media. The liberal media does this a lot, so like we have it happen to us, right? Like when liberal media constantly lies to our face, it constantly messes with our understanding. So it makes sense that we are even confused on this sometimes. What ends up happening is liberal media talks about it as a tech issue, a tech issue, a tech issue. It's not so much that we are having a tech issue. Like, look at how China is building its space station. China is building its space station with this in mind. It sent the main module up. It's now set readying the second module to go up. And one of the final modules for their space station is a spaceport meaning they can build ships, dock ships, and then send ships. The technology already exists. The infrastructure does not exist because nobody has wanted to make the investment because the investment is a 20-year profit margin. You're spending billions, if not trillions of dollars now to get tens of trillions or hundreds of trillions of dollars 20 years from now. That's what you're looking at, because the time it takes to build that, 
the time it takes to get there and then get back and then bring it back down, that's a large amount of time. For most capitalists right now, you're looking at a timetable that they don't want to deal with because the short-term profits are so huge. Why worry about such a long-term gain when you can worry about that later when it's subsidized by governments, by nation-states, through tax dollars, i.e. through stealing our labor, stealing our time, exploiting us further, exploiting the whole world further, to give the corporations a tax break so that they can keep making their billions. Also, they can make the short-term billions and then also get the long-term billions. So the liberal media obviously wants to keep selling it as a tech problem, a tech problem, a tech problem, so that when it finally is shown by China or another nation or whatever that it's not a tech problem but an infrastructure problem, suddenly we can have another Reagan era or Nixon era, let's spend a lot of money on technology and military hardware and develop ourselves into a true powerhouse. Yay, space race. And you can already see the inklings of this, the start of this happening. But it will take about... A, it will take a couple years for that to really kick off the ground and get going. Especially because China has a long-term plan to build the space station, not a short-term plan. It's not cutting corners. It's not trying to get the space station done by sacrificing things for its population. It's planning for everything. Weiner envisioned a bleak future and realized that he himself was culpable, comparing his work on cybernetics to that of the world's greatest scientists who unleashed the destructive power of atomic weapons. I like how I made that comparison before I read that part. In fact, he saw cybernetics in even starker terms than the nukes. The impact of the thinking machine will be a shock certainly of comparable order to that of the atomic bomb, he said in 1949 interview. The replacement of human labor with machines and the social destabilization, mass unemployment, and concentrated economic power that such change would cause is what worried Weiner the most. Let us remember that the automatic machine, whatever we think of any think of any feelings it may have or may not have is the precise economic equivalent of slave labor any labor which competes with slave labor must accept the economic conditions of slave labor it is perfectly clear that this will produce an unemployment situation in comparison with which the present recession and even the depression of the 30s will seem like a pleasant joke bro this man predicting the 20s of the 2000s this man predicting 2020 2021 2022 cheers to weiner realizing he has given us the thing that kills us hey but up all right sorry for the doomer joke i had to i had to predicting way in advance this is 1949 he said this 1949 he said this which is roughly 72 years before it started happening 70ish years before it started happening man literally wouldn't be alive to see it but he was like this is coming the destruction would be political and economic after popularizing cybernetics weiner kind of became kind of a labor and anti-war activist he reached out to unions and to warn them of the dangers of automation and the need to take the threat seriously. He turned down offers from giant corporations that wanted help automating their assembly lines according to his cybernetic principles and refused to work on military research projects. He was against the massive peacetime arms buildup taking place after World War II and publicly lashed out at colleagues for working to help the military build bigger, more efficient tools of destruction. He increasingly hinted at his insider knowledge that a colossal state machine was being constructed by government agencies for the purposes of combat and dom domination, a computerized information system that was sufficiently extensive to include all civilian activities during war, before war, and possibly even between wars, as he described it in The Human Use of Human Beings. Weiner's vocal support of labor and his public opposition to corporate and military work made him a pariah among his military contractor engineer colleagues. 
It also earned him a spot on J. Edgar Hoover's FBI subversive surveillance list. For years, he was suspected of having communist sympathies, his life documented in a thick FBI file that was closed upon his death in 1964. Of Mice and Keyboards <clears throat> J.C.R. Licklider interacted with Norbert Weiner at MIT and participated in conferences and dinner parties where cybernetic ideas were hashed out, debated, and discussed. He was radicalized by Weiner's cybernetic vision. Where Weiner saw danger, Lick saw opportunity. He had no qualms about putting this technology in the service of U.S. corporate and military power. Though most computer engineers thought of computers as little more than oversized calculators, Lick saw them as an extension saw them as extensions of the human mind, and he became obsessed with designing machines that could be seamlessly coupled to human beings. In the 19, in 1960, he published a paper that outlined his vision for the coming man-computer symbiosis, and described in simple terms the kinds of computer components that needed to be invented to make it happen. The paper essentially described a modern multi-purpose computer, complete with a display, display, keyboard, speech recognition software, networking capabilities, and applications that could be used in real time for various tasks. It seems obvious to us now, but back then, Lick's ideas were visionary. His paper was widely circulated in defense circles and earned him an invitation by the Pentagon to do a series of lectures on the topic. This should be sending a chill up y'all's spine because y'all sitting here with our phones over here. We've sitting here with our phones right here next to us. Lick would be so proud. Lick would be so proud. Lick would be so goddamn fucking proud. Sorry, I gotta look at these notifications and get rid of all of them. Okay. My first experience with computers had been listening to a talk by mathematician John von Neumann in Chicago back in 1948. It sounded like science fiction then. A machine that could carry out algorithms automatically, recalled Charles Hertzfeld, a physicist who would go on to, do, to serve as the director of ARPA in the mid-60s. But the next big shock was Lick. Not only could we use these machines for massive calculations, but we could make them useful in our everyday lives. I listened. I got very excited, and in a very real sense, I became a disciple from then on. Indeed, Lick's papers and interviews show that he thought almost any problem could be solved with the right application of computers. He even came up with a plan to end poverty and stimulate young ghetto blacks by having them tinker with computers. He called the process Dynamations, a 1960s version of an idea that is very popular in Silicon Valley even today, 50 years later. The belief that teaching poor kids to code will somehow magically lift them out of poverty and boost global literacy and education rates. What is difficult to convey in a few words is the most is the almost messianic view carried by Licklider of the potential for advances in the use of computers, the way people could relate to computers, and the resultant impact on how people would come to make decisions, explained an internal declassified ARPA report. Lick infected everyone with his quote enthusiasm for the coming computer revolution including top people at arpa who were also on a quest to leverage computers to boost military effectiveness in 1962 after a brief job interview at the pentagon lick moved his family from boston to washington dc and went to work building arpa's command and control research program from scratch at the time, computers were giant metal monsters that occupied entire basements and were attended by multiple technicians. Despite their complexity and size, they were primitive and had less computational power than a 1990s graphic calculator. They also ran one program at a time and each one had to be fed in by hand using punch cards. 
Imagine trying, for example, to direct, to direct a battle with the aid of a computer on such a schedule as this, Lick explained in his 1960 paper. You formulate your problem today. Tomorrow you spend with the programmer. Next week, the computer devotes five minutes to assembling your program and 47 seconds to calculating the answer to your problem. You get a sheet of paper 20 feet long, full of numbers that, instead of providing a final solution, only suggest a tactic that should be explored by simulation. Obviously, the battle would be over before the second step in its planning was begun. And networks? They existed, but like the network that tied Sage together, they were usually highly specialized and built for a particular purpose and function. A network would have to be designed and custom built for every new situation. The way Lick saw it, this was the wrong way to handle the command and control technology problem. What ARPA needed to, was to develop a universal and standardized computer and networking platform that could be modified with minimal effort to handle just about any task. Missile tracking, behavioral studies, databases, voice communications, intelligence analysis, or simple text processing and mailing functions. This computer framework would have a few basic underlying components. It would be easy to use and have an intuitive graphical user interface, feature a universal operating system and programs that could be loaded onto it, and most important, would move away from the calculator mode of computer operation by allowing users to work in real time in the same way people interact with one another. Though this may sound basic and obvious, these kinds of computer tools did not exist in the early 1960s. There was the belief in the heads of a number of people, a small number, that people could become very much more effective in their thinking and decision making if they had the support of a computer system, good displays and so forth, good databases, computation at your command. It was the kind of image that we were working toward the realization of, explained Lick in the ARPA report. It really wasn't a command and control research program, it was an interactive computing program. And my belief was, and still is, you can't really do command and control outside the framework of such a thing. He predicted GUI way in advance. Yup. Yup. This man, the, and, and, and this is directly tied to the CIA shit, by the way. Directly tied to the CIA Phoenix program, because all of this stuff was important and inherently linked to the CIA's ability to organize and analyze the intelligence it was collecting. The crude state of computer technology meant that Lick's goal was still years away, and one thing was for sure. It wouldn't be invented on its own. Someone had to do the work. As Lick saw it, ARPA's primary mission was to throw money at engineers who could build the underlying computer components that a modern command and control system required. At minimum, ARPA would at least get people working on computer projects that pointed in the right direction. Lick saw his job in historical terms. He would use ARPA's budget and influence to push the computer industry into a new territory, one that aligned with his vision and the needs of the defense establishment. Defense establishment equals imperialist colonialist white supremacist hegemony da, da, da. but first he wanted to make sure that u.s intelligence agencies hadn't secretly developed this kind of interactive computing technology already i even went over to the cia and gave them a pitch said lick i had to tell them look i do not know what you're doing about this i hope you're doing the following but let me tell you about what i am doing and then maybe we can figure some way to talk about what the relations are he also arranged a meeting with reps from the NSA and made the same pitch about the beauty of a universal, easy-to-use computer platform. Neither agency was working on interactive computing, but they sure wanted to get their hands on it. The NSA really wanted what I wanted, what I wanted, he recalled in an interview years later. Indeed, intelligence agencies were among the first users of ARPA's command and control program produced just a few years later. Doo-doo-doo. A few years later, by the way, from 1960 is the height of Phoenix program operations in Vietnam.
in case you were wondering. And the use of these computers was vital to the carrying out of Phoenix. Well, you missed my shitting on of Trotsky, but that's all. Don't worry about it, Castle. You got to shit on him in spirit because I was using quotes you provided. So yeah, man, uh, yeah, a few years later is the height of Phoenix program in Vietnam and the use of these computers was vital to the carrying out of Phoenix. ARPA's initial command and control research budget was $10 million. Lick spread that cast through his personal and professional networks in the military academic contractor world. He bankrolled projects on interactive computing and time-sharing graphical interface design, networking, and artificial intelligence at MIT, UC Berkeley, UCLA, Harvard, Carnegie Mellon University, Stanford, and the RAND Corporation. At MIT, Lick set up one of his biggest and most important initiatives, Project MAC, short for Machine Aided Cognition, which evolved into a sophisticated interactive computer environment complete with email, bulletin boards, and multiplayer video games. MIT's Project MAC spawned the first crop of hackers, ARPA contractors who tinkered with these giant computers in their free time. At the Stanford Research Institute, which was also doing ARPA contract work on chemical warfare in Vietnam, Lick funded Douglas C. Engelbart's Augmentation Research Center. This team became legendary in computer circles. It developed hypertext links, multi-user real-time word processing, video conferencing, and most notably, the computer mouse. Lick also jump-started a whole range of networking projects, efforts that would lead directly to the creation of the internet. So you see this thing I have right here? Created by our butt money. Everything technology created by ARPA. These fools thinking that the CIA and the defense establishment isn't involved. One of these was a $1.5 million joint UCLA-UC Berkeley initiative to develop software and hardware for a network that connected multiple computers to multiple users. As a funding proposal explained, this research would be used directly to improve military networks, including the National Military Command System, which was then a new communication system linking the military to the president. The CIA, ARPA, created everything that you use with regards to technology. Hyperlinks, video conferencing, streaming, video games. China may have made that mouse specifically, Soxy, but the technology comes from the CIA. Like... This is what I'm trying to get across to people. No memes right now, y'all. The U.S. military... The U.S. national security hegemony... Built all of this shit to reverse, as a part of reverse engineering, Maoist thought. The reason they were reverse engineering Maoist theory is because Maoist theory was proving successful in leading a successful revolution in China, Vietnam, and the DPRK, all of which are socialist states that still exist today. These bigwigs at the national or the national security establishment were scared shitless of this and thus reverse engineered and then created the internet and all of this stuff so that they could effectively combat everything that they were having to fight abroad and to ensure that it never took root here in the states.
Lick worked hard and fast, and his efforts at ARPA were remarkable. Computer Companies like General Electric and IBM did not initially accept his ideas about interactive computing, but with his tenacity and ARPA's funding, his vision gained traction and popularity and ultimately changed the direction of the computer industry. His tenure at ARPA achieved something else as well. Computer science became more than just a subdivision of electrical engineering. It developed into a proper field of study on its own. The long-term research contracts the ARPA Command and Control Research Division handed out to research teams helped seed the creation of independent computer science departments in universities across the country and tied them closely through funding and personnel to U.S. military establishment. Networking, the dark side. Computer history buffs consider Lick one of the most important personalities in the development of computer science and the internet. A 500-page biography called The Dream Machine by M. Mitchell Waldrop chronicles Lick's life and work. What almost never gets reported, but what comes through the pages and pages of released and declassified government files covering Lick's tenure at ARPA, is just how much his computer research efforts were infused with the agency's greater counterinsurgency mission. The needs of the CIA's Phoenix program for computers coming through. Lick died in 1990, a few months shy of turning 75. In interviews, he had made sure to distance his efforts at ARPA from the agency's less wholesome work fighting insurgencies. There was a kind of cloak and dagger part of it, he recalled in a 1988 interview. There was a fellow named Bill Goddell, who, it seemed to me, was always trying to get control over what I was doing. I could never tell what he was doing, so part, so that part made me nervous. I had one project that I wasn't clearly deeply enough to know what was, and that made me nervous. He readily conceded that he knew something shady was cooking at ARPA and hinted that he took part in some of it, but claimed that he resisted attempts to involve his command and control project in unsavory Vietnam counterinsurgency efforts. I sort of stayed out of that as best as I could. The truth is a bit stickier. Lick's job was to develop the underlying computer and networking technology necessary to fight modern wars. Naturally, this applied to counterinsurgency in a very general way, but his work was also much more specific and direct. For instance, documents show that in March 1962, he attended an influential army symposium that convened in Washington, D.C. to discuss how behavioral science and computer technology could be used to better wage limited war and counterinsurgency. There, Lick was part of a working group dedicated to crafting a U.S. Army counterinsurgency research program that could meet a multi-dimensional communist challenge in paramilitary warfare, in psychological warfare, and in the conventional and nuclear field. The symposium took place just as Lick was starting his job as head of ARPA's behavioral science and command and control research divisions. Going forward, his work at ARPA was part of the military's larger counterinsurgency efforts and directly overlapped with William Goddard's project Agile. and thus also overlapped heavily with the CIA's Phoenix program. As mentioned earlier in the reading, he, or Lick even went to the CIA directly and they made grabby hands at him. Let's not forget that part. He went to the CIA, told him what he was doing, and they made grabby hands. They were like, give me. Naturally, many of ARPA's programs in Southeast Asia, from remote control drones to electronic sensor fences and large-scale human intelligence gathering, were all tied in one way or another to data collection and communication, and they ultimately depended on computer technology to organize and automate these tasks. 
They necessitated tools that could ingest data on people and political movements, compile searchable databases, tie in radio and satellite communications, build models, predict human behavior, and share data quickly and efficiently over great distances between different agencies. Building the underlying technology could that could power all newfangled communication platforms was Lick's job. He certainly never shied away from steering research toward counterinsurgency applications. A glance at the contracts from those days shows him directing funds to projects that used computers for everything from studying and predicting the behavior of people in political system to modeling human cognitive processes and developing simulations that predicted the behavior of international systems. Records show that as early as 1963, Lick's Command and Control Research Division was sharing and intermingling funds with William Goddell's Project Agile. Indeed, even as Lick started at ARPA, Project Agile was deploying data-driven counterinsurgency initiatives in the field. One of the earliest took place between 1962 and 1963 at ARPA's Combat Development Test Center in Thailand on the outskirts of Bangkok. It was called Anthropometric Survey of the Royal Thai Armed Forces. On the surface, it was a benign study that sought to measure the body size of several thousand Thai military personnel to aid in the design of equipment and uniforms. It collected 52 different data points, everything from sitting height to buttock knee length to crotch thigh circumference and seven different measurements of the face and head. The survey's data points had the unpleasant feel of a eugenic study, but the physical measurements were just the surface level of the study. The deeper purpose was rooted in prediction and control. Thai participants were also asked a bevy of personal questions, not just where and when they were born, but who their ancestors were, what their religion was, and what they thought of the king of Thailand, explains Annie Jacobson in The Pentagon's Brain. These questions were at the heart of the study's true goal to create a computer profile of each Thai serviceman and then use it to test predictive models. ARPA wanted to create a prototype showing how it could monitor third world armies for future use. The information would be saved in computer stored in a secure military facility. In 1962, Thailand was a relatively stable country, but it was surrounded by insurgency and unrest on all sides. If Thailand were to become a battle zone, ARPA would have information on Thai soldiers, each of whom could be tracked. Information, like who deserted the Thai army and became an enemy combatant, could be ascertained. Using computer models, models ARPA could create algorithms describing human behaviors in remote areas. And if you don't think, as Douglas Valentine would say, if you don't think they would use this technology on their own soldiers, you would be mistaken. The soldier class is kept on a tight leash. The minute a soldier is no longer useful, they're put to pasture. The minute a soldier is no longer useful, they're put to pasture. Soldiers are weapons. Human weapons, but weapons nonetheless. That's why Thomas Sankara says shit like, a soldier without political education is worse than a criminal. The link between counterinsurgency and computers is not that surprising. The first rudimentary computer technology was developed in the United States almost a century before the Vietnam War to count categorize and study masses of people in the late 1880s an american by the name of herman hollerith invented a tabulation machine under contract with the u.s government to speed the process of counting people for the u.s census because of a huge immigration influx the census had become so unwieldy that it took a full decade to finish the count by hand Polarith came up with an elegant electromechanical solution, a contraption that would later become the backbone of International Business Machines, or IBM, the oldest computer company in the world. His design broke down the process of automatic data collect calculation into two general steps. First, data was digitized, that is, converted into a format that could be understood by a machine via a series of holes punched in a piece of paper. The second step involved feeding this paper into an apparatus containing electrical pins that tabulated and sorted the punch cards on the basis of position and arrangement of the punched holes. Hollerith initially thought to record the information on a long strip of paper, like a ticker tape. 
but he quickly abandoned the idea because it made it too difficult to locate and isolate individual records. In a census, the machine would process hundreds of thousands and even millions of individuals. The trouble was that if, for example, you wanted statistics regarding Chinamen, you'd have to run miles of paper to count a few Chinamen, Holler Earth explained. So, even from the get-go, the census wasn't about actually just tabulating population, it was about tracking people. For those wondering, the reason they would need to track Chinamen is because they were using Chinese people to build the railroads and they were exploiting anti-China sentiments to do so and so on and so forth. Nasty shit. Yay, America! So he went with a different idea. Each person each person would be represented by a separate punch card. The inspiration came from an observation he made on a train. To prevent people from passing around and reusing train tickets, conductors punched out a passenger's description on a little sleep of paper. Height type, height, type of hairstyle, eye color, and nose type. It was an elegant and powerful solution. Each person had their own card and each card had a standardized pattern of holes that corresponded to information collected by the census takers. Each card would encode a person's attributes, age, sex, religion, occupation, place of birth, marital status, criminal history. Once a clerk transferred the data from a census form onto a punch card, the cards would be fed into a machine that could count and arrange them in all sorts of ways. It could provide aggregate totals for each category or find and isolate groups of people in specific categories. Any trait, nationality, employment status, disability could be singled out and sorted quickly. Allerith described his system as making a punch photo of each person and indeed it did. A first generation digital dossier of people and their lives. Used to count the census in 1890, Hollerith tabulators were a huge success, cutting the time it took to crunch the numbers from years to months. The machines also lent census trackers the ability to slice, dice, and mine the data in ways that had never been possible. For example, to find a particular person or group of people, say Americans with at least one Japanese parent in California or all orphans living in New York with a felony, this kind of fine grain analysis on a mass scale was unprecedented. Overnight, Hollerith tabulators transformed census taking from a simple count into something very different, something that approached an early form of mass surveillance. Newton Dexter North, a wool industry lobbyist, lobbyist chosen to head the 1900 census, was astounded by the ability of Holler, Hollerith's tabulators to so precisely tabulate racial data. Like many upper-class Americans of his day, North worried that the massive influx of immigrants from Europe was destroying the fabric of American society, causing social and political unrest, and threatening the nation's racial purity. This fear of immigration would become intertwined with anti-communist hysteria, leading to repression of workers and labor unions across the country. North saw statisticians like himself as technocratic soldiers, America's last line of defense against a foreign corrupting influence, and he saw the tabulator machine as their most powerful weapon. This immigration is profoundly affecting our civilization, our institutions, our habitats, our habits are and our ideals. It was transplanted here it has transplanted here alien tongues, alien religions, and alien theories of government. It has been a powerful influence in the rapid disappearance of the puritanical outlook upon life, North warned, but he heaped praises, praise on Hollerith's newfangled computation device. I cannot detain the reader with a, with a statement of the correlation of the data of individual elements of the population, in combination with other data, beyond the reach of hand tabulation which this invention opened up. Without it, we could never hope to lay bare the truth we must lay bare all the truth we must have if we are to cope successfully with the problems growing out of the heterogeneous cumuling of races which our defective immigration laws are forcing upon us. Even a century ago, same shit, nothing's changed. Two decades after its debut, Hollerith tabulation technology was absorbed into IBM. Improved and refined over the years, the machines became a runaway hit with businesses and government. 
They were used extensively by the U.S. military during World War II to keep an up-to-date tally of troop numbers and were even dragged on shore during the invasion of Normandy. They were also used to process the internment of Japanese Americans during the war. And after President Franklin Delano Roosevelt created the social security system, IBM and its tabulators functions as a, functioned as a de facto privatized arm that did all the processing and accounting for America's pension system. Perhaps most infamously, IBM's tabulator machines were employed by Nazi Germany to run late death labor camps and to institute a system of racial surveillance by enabling the regime to comb genealogical data to root out people with traces of Jewish blood. Not just Jewish, but all sorts of different types of people that were seen as non-Aryan. Willy Heidinger, head of IBM operations in Germany and a devout member of the Nazi party, knew the part he played. With the help of IBM tabulators in studying a sick German people and helping Adolf Hitler provide the cure. We are very much like the physician in that we dissect cell by cell the German cultural body. We report every individualistic characteristic on a little card. He said in a fiery speech dedicating a new IBM factory in Berlin, We are proud that we may assist in such a task, a task that provides our nation's physician with the materials he needs for his examinations. Our physician can then determine whether the calculated values are in harmony with the health of our people. It also means that if such is not the case, our physician can take corrective procedures to correct the sick circumstances. Hail to our German people and the Fuhrer. Yikes. Yikes. Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany's use of IBM technology is an extreme example, but it underscores the connection between the development of early computer technologies and management of large. We're just gonna strike through. This is, is actually par for the course. Settler colonialism evolved into full on fascism and the fascists of Nazi Germany learned from the fascists of America and Canada and thus employed the same technologies and systems of people management that these settler colonial nations were employing again Magoki said this i'm gonna set, keep quoting Magoki on this because it's important that we all understand this shit phoenix program and all of this shit is just colonialism on steroids they did this during colonialism to the indigenous. They did this to their own peoples when they were colonizing Europe and taking control of it under a landed ruling class. Ain't nothing extreme about this. This is just the par for the course, y'all. But it underscores the connection between the development of early computer technology and the study and management of large groups of people. IBM tabulators remained in operation through the 1980s. Indeed, until J.C.R. Licklider and ARPA developed interactive computer systems, tabulators and punch cards were the principal means by which militaries, government agencies, and corporations wrote programs and worked with complex data sets. There is no doubt that Licklider's computer research at ARPA was intimately bound to the agency's expanding counterinsurgency mission. But in internal discussions with his ARPA contractors, engineers, and social scientists at major universities across the country, Lick sought to de-emphasize the military's applications of his command and control project, instead shifting the focus to the need to build productivity-boosting computer technology for his civilian collaborators and their colleagues. De-emphasize the military applications, emphasize the civilian applications. You know, kind of like nuclear technology. Emphasize nuclear power plants, de-emphasize the, the ramifications of nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Funny that. And for those of you wondering, nuclear weapons don't just mean WMDs, they also mean um, depleted uranium shells. 
which are a distinct feature of Western militaries. Distinct feature of Western militaries is depleted uranium shells. DU for short. DU for short. Dirty bombs, dirty munitions, chemical warfare, defoliation, crops destruction, spread of diseases. De-emphasize the military applications. Emphasize the civilian applications. Always how it works. Always how it fucking works. De-emphasize military application. Emphasize civilian application. De-emphasize the, uh, the, the chances of its success in our lifetime. Emphasize how it's a technology issue. So that we spend more money and put more labor hours into it. In a letter to his contractors, Lick wrote, The fact is, as I see it, that the military greatly needs solutions to many or most of the problems that will arise if we try to make good use of the facilities that are coming into existence. I am hoping that there will be, in our individual efforts, enough evident advantage in cooperative programming and operation to lead us to solve the problems and thus to bring into being the technology that the military needs. When problems arise clearly in the military context and seem not to appear in the research context, then ARPA can take steps to handle them on an ad hoc basis as i say however hopefully many of the problems will be essentially the same and essentially as important in the research context as in the military context uh oh tee hee hee on a fundamental level the computer technology required to power active military operations was no different from the tech scientists and researchers used to do their work Collaboration, real-time collection, and sharing of data, predictive modeling, image analysis, natural language processing, intuitive controls and displays, and computer graphics. If the tools developed by ARPA contractors worked for them and their academic buddies, they would also work for the military with only slight modifications. Today's military takes this for granted. Computer technology was always dual use, to be used in both commercial and military applications. De-emphasizing ARPA's military purpose had the benefit of boosting morale among computer scientists who were more eager to work on the technology if they believed it wasn't going to be used to bomb people. There it is, folks. Yay! De-emphasizing ARPA's military purpose had the benefit of boosting morale among computer scientists who were more eager to work on the technology if they believed it wasn't going to be used to bomb people. Two years into his job at ARPA, Lick began to view the various computing projects he had seeded all over the country from UCLA to Stanford and MIT as parts of a larger connected unit, computer thinking centers that at some point in the near future would be netted together into a single unified distributed computing machine. It mirrored the vision of a network society he had outlined in the 1960s. First, you connect the powerful computers via a high bandwidth network. Then, you connect users to these computers with telephone lines, satellite dishes, or radio signals. Whichever technology was best suited to their particular needs. It would not matter whether people logged in from home, work, a jeep crawling through the jungles of Vietnam, or a stealth bomber flying 10 miles above the Soviet Union. In such a system, the speed of the computers would be balanced and the cost of the gigantic memories and the sophisticated programs would be divided by the number of users, he had written. In 1963, four years after publishing that paper, Lick began coyly referring to this idea as the Great Intergalactic Network. Fundamentally, his vision for a distributed interactive computing network is not very different from what the internet looks like today.
Crazy. Crazy. In 1964, two years after coming to ARPA, Lick decided that he had fulfilled his mission of getting the agency's command and control research program up and running. He moved his family to Westchester County, New York, to start a cushy gig running a research division at IBM. Younger and more energetic men would have to finish the job he started. The ARPANET. Lawrence Roberts was 29 years old when he reported to duty at ARPA's Command and Control Research Division inside the Pentagon. The year was 1966, and he was hired for a big and important job, to make Lick's great intergalactic network a reality. Everything was in place. ARPA had a range of functional, overlapping interactive computer projects spread across the country, including at the following centers. MIT's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, MIT's Project MAC, Stanford's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, Stanford's Research Institute, Carnegie Mellon University, University of California, Irving, University of California, Los Angeles, University of California, Berkeley, University of California, Santa Barbara, Rand Corporation, Utah University. It was time to wire all these computer, pro computer centers together and have them function as one unit. Oh, you weren't here for it, Castle. But yeah, the first video games were also made by... Uh, ARPA. ARPA funding of Stanford. Yes. It was time to wire all these computer centers together and have them function as one unit. It would be called the ARPANET. Roberts came from the MIT Lincoln Laboratory, where he had been working on graphics and computer communication systems. Some of his colleagues found the strict atmosphere there stifling. In fact, two of them left in a huff because of the lab's no pets policy. They wanted to bring a cat into the lab. Lincoln would not allow them to bring a cat in, and they decided that was unfair. They would go somewhere where cats were tolerated, he recalled, noting wryly that the cats were not for companionship but for gruesome experimentation. It was really a fight over having that connection with the brain electrodes and all of that. Lincoln just did not want anything to do with it. But Roberts had no such problem. He had a broad forehead, big floppy earlobes, and a stern but calm and measured way of talking. He was a math and theory kind of guy. He thrived at Lincoln Lab, working on a moonshot algorithms, image compression, and data network design. He knew Lick and was inspired by his vision of a universal network that could net all sorts of systems together. Indeed, Roberts was an efficient networker. Within a few weeks, he had the place, one of the world's largest, most labyrinthine buildings, memorized. Getting around the building was complicated, but the fact that certain hallways were blocked off as classified areas, Roberts obtained a stopwatch and began timing various routes to his frequent destinations, right? Katie Hafner and Mike and Matthew Lyon in their upbeat and zany book about the creation of the internet, where wizards stay up late. Inside the Pentagon, people started calling the most efficient path between two points Larry's Route. Roberts liked building networks, not just the social kind. He was reserved and extremely socially adverse. None of his co-workers, not even the ones closest to him, knew much about him or anything about his personal life. He was obsessed with efficiency and was really into speed reading, studying and improving his technique to the point where he could read 30,000 words a minute. He'd pick up a paperback and be through with it in 10 minutes. It was typical Larry, one of his friends recalled. Robert's task was daunting. Connect all of ARPA's far-flung interactive computer projects with computers made by a half a dozen different companies, including a one-of-a-kind ILLIAC supercomputer into one network. Almost every conceivable item of computer hardware and software will be in the network. This is the greatest challenge of the system as well as its greatest ultimate value, said Roberts. Oh, sorry, stretching. Not long after arriving at ARPA, he convened a series of meetings with a core group of contractors and several outside advisors to hash out the design. The sessions brought together a mix of ideas and people. One of the most important was Paul Barron, who had worked at RAND designing communication systems for the Air Force that could survive a nuclear attack. Over time, the group came up with a design key to the network would be... Uh, with a design. Key to the network would be what Roberts called interface message processors or IMPs. 
these were dedicated computers that would form connective tissue of the distributed network connected by telephone lines leased from AT&T they would send and receive data check for errors and ensure that data successfully reached the destination if part of the network went down the IMPs would attempt to retransmit the information using a different pathway IMPs were the generic gateways to ARPA's network, functioning independently of the computers that used them. Different makes and models of computers did not need to be designed to understand each other. All they needed to do was communicate with the IMPs. In a way, IMPs were the first internet routers. Finally, in July 1968, Roberts put out a contract request to over a hundred computer companies and military contractors. Bids came back from some of the biggest names in the business. Both IBM and Raytheon were interested, but the contract was ultimately awarded to an influential early computer research firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Bolt, Baranac, and Newman, where J.C.R. Licklider was a senior executive. Licklider making his way back into the game, baby. The very first ARPANET node powered by the IMPs went live on October 29, 1969, linking Stanford to UCLA. The first attempt to connect barely worked and dropped after a few seconds, but by the next month, connections to UC Santa Barbara and University of Utah were also made. Six months later, seven more nodes became operational. By the end of 1971, more than 15 nodes existed and the network kept growing. In October 1972, a full demonstration of the ARPANET was carried out at the first International Conference of Computer Communications in Washington, D.C. It astounded people. ARPA contractors fit out a hall with dozens of computer terminals that could access computers across the country and even a link in Paris. Software available for demonstration included an air traffic simulation program, weather and meteorological models, chess programs, database systems, and even a robotic psychiatrist program called ELISA that provided mock counseling. Engineers ran around like children at an amusement park, overwhelmed by how all the different parts flawlessly fit together and worked as one interactive machine. It was, a di it was difficult for many experienced professionals at that time to accept the fact that a collection of computers, wide hand circuits, and mini computer switching nodes, pieces of equipment totaling well over a hundred, could all function together reliably. But the ARPANET demonstration lasted for three days and clearly displayed its reliable operation in public, Roberts recalled. The network provided ultra-reliable service to thousands of attendees during the entire length of the conference. Even so, not everyone was excited by what ARPA was doing. The Octoputer serves the ruling class. September 26, 1969 was a mild fall day at Harvard University, but all was not well. Several hundred angry students gathered on campus and marched on the office of Harvard's dean. I wonder what the students are angry about. They piled inside and refused to leave. A day earlier, 500 students had marched through campus and a small contingent of activists from Students for a Democratic Society had broken into the school's Office of International Affairs and forced the administrators out onto the street. Similar troubles, troubles were afoot just across the river at MIT where students were holding protests and teach-ins. Flyers posted on both campuses railed against computerized people manipulation and the blatant prostitution of social science for the aims of the war machine. One leaflet warned, until the military social science complex is eliminated, social scientists will aid the enslavement rather than the liberation of mankind. What exactly were the students protesting? The ARPANET. Vietnam is the most blatant example of the U.S. attempt to control underdeveloped countries for its own strategic and economic interests. This global policy that prevents the economic and social developments of the third world is imperialism. In serving these policies, the U.S. government has no qualms about setting up a project that ties together MIT, Harvard, Lincoln Labs, and the entire Cambridge Research and Development Complex. 
Earlier that year, activists from Students for a Democratic Society got their hands on a confidential ARPA proposal written by none other than J.C. Licklider. The document ran to almost 100 pages and outlined the creation of a joint Harvard-MIT ARPA program that would directly aid the agency's counterinsurgency mission. It was called the Cambridge Project. Once complete, it would allow any intelligence analyst or military planner connected to the ARPANET to upload dossiers, financial transactions, opinion surveys, welfare roles, criminal record histories, and any other kind of data, and to analyze them in all sorts of sophisticated ways. Dang. Sifting through reams of information to generate predictive models, mapping out social relationships, and running simulations that could predict human behavior. The project emphasized providing analysts with the power to study third world countries and left wing movements. I got a word. I got. I got two words for y'all. Anyone? Well, not two words. Anyone remember Cambridge Analytica? Eh? Anybody remembering Cambridge Analytica? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pepperidge Farm remembers. Project Cambridge. Cambridge Analytica. 50 years apart. Hmm. Need I say more, friends, comrades? No, I don't. Let's continue. Students saw Cambridge Project and the bigger ARPANET that plugged into it as a weapon. A pamphlet handed out at the MIT protest explained the whole computer setup and the ARPA computer network will enable the government for the first time to consult relevant survey data rapidly enough to be used in policy decisions. The net result of this will be to make Washington's international policemen more effective in suppressing popular movements around the world. The so-called basic research to be supported by Project CAM will deal with questions like why do peasant movements or student groups become revolutionary? The results of this research will similarly be used to, to suppress progressive movements. Another booklet featured a mock advertisement that gave a visual representation to these fears. It featured the Octoputer, a computer shaped like an octopus that had tentacles reaching into every sector of society. The Octoputer's arms are long and strong, read the mock ad copy. It sits in the middle of your university, country, and reaches, helping hands out in all directions. Suddenly, your empire works harder. More of your agents use the computer, solving more problems, finding more facts. To activists, ARPA's Cambridge Project was part of a network system of surveillance, political control, and military conquest being quietly assembled by diligent researchers and at college campuses around the country. The college kids had a point. The Cambridge Project, also known as Project CAM, was born out of an idea proposed in 1968 by Lick Leiter and his longtime colleague Ithiel de Sola Poole, an MIT political science professor and expert in propaganda and psychological operations. As head of ARPA's command and control research project and behavioral sciences program, Lick had seen how the agency struggled with the mountains of data generated by his counterinsurgency initiatives in Southeast Asia. A major goal of his work during his brief stint at ARPA was to jumpstart a program that would ultimately build the underlying systems that would make computer-aided counterinsurgency and command and control more efficient. Tools that ingest and analyze data, create searchable databases, pro build predictive models, and allow people to share that information across vast distance, distances. Pool was driven by the same passion. Poole, a descendant of a prominent rabbinical family that traced its roots to medieval Spain, was an MIT professor and renowned expert in communications and propaganda theory. Starting in the late 1950s, he ran MIT's Center for International Studies, a prestigious department for communication to studies that was funded by the CIA and helped set up MIT's Department of Political Science. He was a hardcore anti-communist and a pioneer in the use of opinion polling and computer modeling for political campaigns. 
With his expertise, he was tapped to guide the messaging for John F. Kennedy's 1960 presidential bid, crunching poll numbers and running simulations on issues in voter groups. Poole's data-driven approach to political campaigning was on the cutting edge of a new wave of electoral technologies that sought to win by pre pre-testing people's preferences and biases and then calibrating a candidate's message to fit them. Oh, too much. These new targeted messaging tactics enabled by rudimentary computers had a lot of fans in Washington and over the next several decades would come to dominate the way politics were done. We also, uh, they also inspired fear that America's political system was being taken over by manipulative technocrats who cared more about the marketing and selling of ideas than they did about what those ideas actually meant. Yes, Castle, we are we are behind where middle class rich white kids were in the 60s on the internet. We have gone that far backwards. White kids in the 60s are more radical than people on the internet right now. Yikes. For those of you who don't know, the, the 1960s middle class whites were kind of on the fence about black liberation. So they were still pretty anti-black and pretty racist to the point that black radicals and black activists and black students were like walking out on white students and the like. So when those people are somehow more radical and have a better position on the internet than people today, who supposedly claim to be super radical, it's, it's a shame, really. It's a shame. Let's try again, but with more learning this time. <laughs> we in the blender. Poole was much more than a campaign pollster. He was also an expert in propaganda and psychological operations and had close ties to ARPA's counterinsurgency efforts in Southeast Asia, Latin America, and the Soviet Union. From 1961 through 1962, his company, the Simul Maddox Corporation, worked on ARPA counterinsurgency programs in South Vietnam as part of William Goddard's Project Agile, including a major con contract to study and analyze the motivation of captured Vietnamese rebels to develop strategies to win the allegiance of South Vietnamese peasants. Poole's work in Vietnam helped further the idea that a purely technical solution could stop the insurgency. Simul Maddox relied heavily on the works of Poole's MIT colleague Lucien Pai, who had argued since the early 1950s that communism was a psychological disease of transitioning peoples. In his influential politics, personality, and nation building, he explained that psychological failures lay at the root of stalled nation building efforts writes historian Joy Road in The Last Stand of, Cycle of the Psycho-Cultural Cold Warriors. To win the war for hearts and minds, Americans needed to design a psychologically appropriate political infrastructure for the emerging nation, a structure through which peasants could develop the appropriate psychological ties to the state. Military research would write the protocol for a kind of national therapy. At the same time, Simul Maddox contractors gathered data in Vietnam's sweltering jungles. Poole's company worked on another ARPA initiative called Project ComCon, short for the Communist Communications. Run out of Poole's home base at MIT, ComCom was an ambitious attempt to build a computer simulation of the internal communication systems of the Soviet Union. The objective was to study the effects that foreign news and radio broadcasts were having on Soviet society as well as to pro model and predict the kind of reaction a particular broadcast, say a presidential speech or a breaking news program, would have on the Soviet Union. Unsurprisingly, Poole's models showed that covert CIA attempts to influence the Soviet Union by beaming radio propaganda were having a big effect, and these efforts needed to be stepped up. Un 
surprisingly, Poole's models show that covert CIA attempts to influence the Soviet Union by beaming radio propaganda were having a big effect and that efforts needed and that these efforts needed to be stepped up. I'm gonna grab a drink. Y'all sit with that fuck. Y'all sit with that shit. Okay, I also use the restroom because I need to. Never in history did a ruling party literally turn over the mass media to forces bent on its own destruction and the state it led as did the leaders of the CPSU, Mike David Dow, communist journalist via Roger Kieran and Tom Thomas Kenny. In June 1994, I, Odin, put the same question, did he understand from the beginning that Gorbachev's reforms might require the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviet system, to Yakov Lev during a dinner chat. He replied that he did realize that they were destroying the old regime, adding with a certain glee, and we did it before our opponents woke up in time to prevent it. Interview via William Odom from Roger Kieran and Tom Kenny. Through most of 1989, U.S. billionaire George Soros, whose wealth came from currency speculation, had a secret advisory team in Moscow with access to the highest circles where they advocated the creation of an open sector, a kind of beachhead for capitalism until a full countrywide restoration of capitalism occurred. Roger Kieran and Thomas Kenny. Bangers. Thank you, Castle, for those. So when you guys wonder why China has the firewall that it does against Western media for its people, need we say more? There's a firewall in China for a reason. There's a firewall in Iran for a reason. Go fuck yourselves. Like literally, fuck off. Like take, take both of these and shove them so far up your ass that they stick out of your mouth. Okay? Okay? Take a cactus and shove it up your here here. I've got a perfect little I got a perfect little thing for y'all. Okay Perfect little thing for y'all Perfect little thing Da 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 da. 
Go fuck yourself with a cactus. Most of the things of a positive character that are happening in the Soviet Union today are explainable only in terms of the influence of the West, for which the most single, the most important single channel is radio, Poole said in a speech explaining the results of, of the ComCom study. In the long run, those... Those who are talking to the Soviet Union are not talking to deaf ears. Their voices will be heard and will, be ma will make a great deal of difference. But Poole was never satisfied with ComCom's performance. Even in the late 1960s, the crude state of computer technology meant that it took several months for him and his team to build a model for just one situation. It was painstaking work that clearly required more powerful computer tools. Tools that simply did not exist. Poole saw computers as more than just apparatuses that could speed up social research. His work was infused with a utopian belief in the power of cybernetic systems to manage societies. He was among a group of Cold War technocrats who envisioned computer technologies and network systems and deployed in a way that directly intervened in people's lives, creating a kind of safety net that spanned the world and helped run societies in a harmonious manner, managing strife and conflict out of, co out of existence. This system wouldn't be messy or wishy-washy or open to interpretation, nor would it involve socialist economic theories in fact it wouldn't involve politics at all but would be an applied science based on math a kind of engineering i'm gonna just stick my Bayef's article right here Da 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 by 1983, American high-tech exports to the Soviet Union were valued at only 39 million compared to 219 million in 1975. This economic warfare did not stop with denying the Soviets access to high-tech. The U.S. also sabotaged the goods the Soviets did receive. In 1984, for example, the U.S. supplied the Soviet Union with faulty blueprints for gas turbine components and through middlemen sold the Soviet Union defective computer chips. Such moves cost the Soviet Union untold time and money. So when you see China make the deal it did under Deng, there was a reason for it because they were witnessing under the Deng era the Soviet Union being cheated and lied to about tech stuff. So, uh, no, it's okay to cackle. I'm making this funny because um, I want this to stand out in people's minds. I want this part to stand out in your understanding so that when you see some of these people going around on Twitch having partial analysis or being too liberal, you can point out you can you can do the Shrek meme with the short little fucking king dude and point at them and go, ha ha, ha ha. Uh -huh. And you don't have to say anything. You just get to point and laugh at them. Because when you want to tell them something, just say, yo, you should really check out this book, Yasha Levine's Surveillance Valley, or check out CIA's Organized Crime by Douglas Valentine, or check out this article that I linked by Mabea, and tell them, yo, if you haven't read this shit or you don't know this shit, then like, I can't have a conversation with you about it because you're not going to actually like believe anything I tell you. But everything I'm telling you is based in historical fact. And you just are ignorant. And like that level of ignorance, you can't overcome it with a, with a debate or a conversation. Like you could try and teach it, but that would be a class. That would not be a debate. That would be them sitting there and shutting up and listening. Yeah, there was a lot of work to stop um, Soviet tech advancement at varying points. In 1964, at the same time his company was doing counterinsurgency work for ARPA in Vietnam, 
school became a vocal supporter of Project Camelot, a different counterinsurgency effort funded by the U.S. Army and backed by part of ARPA. Camelot was just a code name. The project's full official title was Methods for Predicting and Influencing Social Change and Internal War Potential. That's the article I just linked from Mabeuf and I put here is referenced in... This is referenced in that. Its ultimate goal, to build a radar system for left-wing revolutions, a computerized early warning system that could predict and prevent political movements before they got off the ground. One of the project's anticipated end products was an automated information collection and handling system into which social research could feed facts for quick analysis. Essentially, the computer system would check up-to-date intelligence information against a list of precipitants and preconditions, right? historian Joy Road. Revolution could be stopped before its initiators even knew they were headed down the path of political violence. Do do do. Gotta love how all of this shit comes to light, huh? Gotta love it. Project Camelot was a big undertaking that involved dozens of leading American academics. It was very dear to Poole personally, but it never got very far. Chilean academics who were invited to participate in Project Camelot blew the whistle on its military intelligence ties and accused the United States of trying to build a computer-assisted coup machine. The affair blew into a, big, into a huge scandal, a special session of the Chilean... A uh, Senate was convened to investigate the allegations, and politicians denounced the initiative as a plan of Yankee espionage. With all this international attention and negative pub publicity, Project Camelot was shut down in 1965. In 1968, Lick's Cambridge project at MIT picked up where Camelot left off. And I got to put a link. Don't forget the Phoenix program exists and ensures the longevity of these types of works, research, and so forth. Do, da, da, da. To Lick, the Cambridge project was the realization of the interactive computer technology he had been pushing for. Finally, after nearly a decade, computer technolo computing technology had advanced to a point where it could help the military use data to fight insurgencies. The Cambridge project included several components. It ran a common operating system and a suite of standard programs custom tailored to the military's behavioral science mission that could be accessed from any computer with an ARPANET connection. It was a kind of stripped-down 1960s version of Palantir, the powerful data mining surveillance and prediction software the military intelligence planners use today. The project also funded various efforts to use these programs in ways that were beneficial to the military, including compiling various intelligence databases. As a bonus, the Cambridge Project served as a training ground for a new cadre of data scientists and military planners who learned to be proficient in data mining on it. The Cambridge Project had another, less menacing side. Financial analysts, psychologists, sociologists, CIA agents. The Cambridge Project was useful to anyone interested in working with large and complex data sets. The technology was universal and dual use, so on one level, the goal of the Cambridge Project was generic. Still, the project was customized to the military's needs, with particular focus on fighting insurgencies and rolling back communism. A big part of the proposal Lick submitted to ARPA in 1968 focused on the various types of data banks the Cambridge Project would compile and make available to military analysts and behavioral scientists connected through the ARPA net. Public opinion polls from all countries, cultural patterns of all tribes and peoples of the world, archives on comparative communism, files on the contemporary world communist movements, political participation of various countries, this includes such variables as voting, membership in associations, activity of political parties, etc., youth movements, mass unrest and political movements under conditions of rapid social change, data on national integration, particularly in plural societies, the integration of ethnic 
racial and religious minorities, the merging or splitting of present political units, international propaganda output, peasant attitudes and behaviors, international armament expenditures and trends. It was very clear that the Cambridge Project wasn't just a tool for research, it was counterinsurgency technology. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, huge anti-war protests erupted on our university campuses across the country. Activists occupied buildings, stole documents, published newsletters, staged sit-ins and marches, clashed with police and became increasingly violent. At the University of Michigan, students attempted to block campus recruitment by Dow Chemical, which produced the napalm that rained down on Vietnam. Someone blew up the Army Mathematics Research Center at the University of Wisconsin. The Weather Underground set off a bomb inside Harvard Center for International Affairs. They wanted to stop the Vietnam War. They also wanted to halt the cooperation of academic research by the military-industrial complex. ARPA programs were a constant target. Students protested against the ILLIAC-4, the massive ARPA supercomputer housed at the University of Illinois. They targeted the Stanford Research Institute, an important ARPA contractor involved in everything from chemical weapons research to counterinsurgency work and development of the ARPANET. Students occupied the building shouting, get SRI out and down with SRI. A few brave contractors stayed behind to protect ARPA's computers from the angry mob, telling protesters that computers were politically neutral. But... Are they? The student demonstrations against the Cambridge Project were part of this wave of protests sweeping the country. The common belief student among students at MIT and Harvard was that the Cambridge Project had and the bigger ARPA network it was tied to was essentially a front for the CIA. Even some professors began turning on it. The language of Lick Leiter's proposal, talk about propaganda and monitoring political movements, was so direct and so obvious that it could not be ignored. It confirmed students and activists' fear about computers and computer networks and gave them a glimpse into how military planners wanted to use these technologies as tools of surveillance and social control. Yep. Noam Chomsky, between 1963 and 1965, consulted on military-sponsored project to establish natural language as an operational language for command and control. In 1989, when Pentagon advisor John Deutsch applied to be president of MIT, Chomsky supported his candidacy. Later, when Deutsch became head of the CIA, the New York Times quoted Chomsky as saying he has more honesty and integrity than anyone I've ever met. If somebody's got to run, be running the CIA, I'm glad it's him. Yet again, Chomsky and Trotsky are two people I don't like. I don't listen to them. I don't trust them. Why trust either of them when they are both speaking out of two sides of their mouths? Both of them are behaving like Janices. Why the fuck would you ever listen to anything these people say? Or why would you ever try to compartmentalize, quote unquote, the good things they say from the bad things they say? That's just you being a fucking dumbass. Hey, Dumb shits. If the CIA uses somebody and they like using them and they keep using them or they make them foundational to some of the shit they're doing, maybe you should avoid the shit out of them. Do you see them using Stalin? Do you see them using Ho Chi Minh? Do you see them using Che or Castro? Chavez? Do you see them using MAS? Evo Morales? Do you see them using any of these people? No, you see them only ever using people that they can bend the spine of. They didn't use Parenti. They didn't use Sankara, Lumumba. Shit. John Deutsch was the same dude who covered for CIA drug smuggling. Yep. Mm-hmm. A crew of activists from Students for a Democratic Society produced a small but informative booklet that laid out the group's opposition to the initiative, the Cambridge Project, Social Science for Social Control. It sold for a quarter. The cover features a series of punch cards being fed into a computer that transformed black militancy, student protest, strikes, and welfare struggles into counterinsurgency, ghetto pacification, and strike breaking. 
At one point, the pamphlet's producers gathered on Technology Square at the edge of the MIT campus. They attained a copy of Lick's Cambridge Project proposal and set it to fire, and set fire to it. Lick, ever enthusiastic and confident in his ability to sway people to his way of thinking, met the protesting students outside and attempted to reassure them that everything was okay. That this ARPA project wasn't some nefarious initiative cooked up by spies and generals, but students would have none of it. The group was hostile. Doe Yen Yatema, the director of the Cambridge Project, told M. Waldrop, but he, Licklider, was pretty cool about it. At one point, in fact, they had a copy of the proposal and tried to set fire to it. Not very successfully. Well, after a few minutes, Lick said, look, if you want to burn a stack of paper, don't try to light it. Don't just try to light it. Spread the papers out first. So he showed them how, and it really did burn much better. But the students gathered there had a deep understanding of the political and economic dimensions of ARPA's military research, and they were not going to be dismissed like petulant school children. They persisted. Lick tried to be a good sport about it, but he was disappointed. Not in the project. No, he was down with, on the kids. He believed the protesters did not understand the project and completely misread its intentions and military ties. Why couldn't young people understand that this technology was completely neutral? Why did they have to politicize everything? Why did they think America was always the enemy and would use, the tech, use technology for political control? He saw the whole thing as a symptom of the degradation of American youth culture. Part of the reason the internet came to be at all. The demonstration against the Cambridge Project involved hundreds of people. They were ultimately a part of a larger anti-war movement at MIT and Harvard that attracted the leading lights of the anti-war movement, including Howard Zinn. Noam Chomsky showed up to lambast academics, accusing them of running cover for violent imperialism by investing in the aura of science. But, the en but in the end, we don't care about this. We delete this. Like I said, we delete this. Noam Chomsky trying to ride on the coattails of the anti-war movement after he was already participating in military-sponsored projects? Fuck out of here. Don't care. Cunt. He'll get what's coming to him. All the academics who have been Janices will get what's coming to them. Karma comes. Karma always comes. Silver, you're just being an asshole. You're being reactionary. You're being violent. No, I'm not. Tell me, what did I, violent I said? They'll get what's coming to them. Karma will find them. They have done wrong. You can't say you're anti-war and then go work for the fucking CIA and talk good about a CIA director. Shut the fuck up. I don't care whether, like, you want, if you want civility, this ain't the place for civility. But in the end, the protests didn't have much of an effect. The Cambridge project proceeded as planned. The only change, future proposals and internal discussions for funding omitted overt references to military applications and the study of communism in third world societies and project contractors simply referred to what they were doing as behavioral science. But behind the scenes, the military and intelligence dimension of the project remained foremost. Indeed, a classified guide from 1973 commissioned by ARPA for the Central Intelligence Agency noted that although the Cambridge Project was still experimental, it was nonetheless one of the most flexible tools available for complex data and statistical analysis in existence and recommended that the CIA's international security analysts learn how to use it. Noam Chomsky's research on language for the CIA while at MIT is what gave rise to the change from overt language about military applications and communism to just referring to these projects Just referring to these aspects of the research.
as science. Fuck him. Yasha can be nice if he wants. Yasha can try and like sell his copies of his books, but I'm not here. I'm not here to play games with a bunch of celeb motherfuckers. I ain't here to play games with shit fuckers who do stuff like what Noam Chomsky and uh, Daniel Ellsberg do. Don't believe me? Yeah, don't believe me here. Dale Peter Scott had also been marginalized as a result of his 1972 book, The War Conspiracy, and his book, and his 1993 book, Deep Politics and the Death of JFK. Peter supported me, Douglas Valentine, that is, and a few years after the Phoenix book was published, I mentioned to him that I was writing an article based on my interviews with Scoton and Conine about Ellsberg's deep political association with the CIA. Peter is Ellsberg's friend. Is Ellsberg's friend, and even though the article had the potential to embarrass Ellsberg, Peter arranged for me to interview Ellsberg. Peter gave me Ellsberg's number, and I called at a prearranged time. And the first thing Ellsberg said to me was, "You can't possibly understand me because you're not a celebrity." This is what people say about Noam Chomsky. Stop being critical of him. Stop it. Shut the fuck up. You work for the CIA in that capacity. Accept it. Now, there will be people who will be like, well, Silver, you did work for the Army. You were a cryptologic network warfare specialist for the Army. Yeah, I was a grunt for the Army. I did paper pushing for the Army. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you want to use that to discredit me and not listen to me, that's your business. Do that. But then if you try and uphold Noam Chomsky or Trotsky or Ellsberg or any of these other cunts, well, that's the real hypocrisy right there is you're using my past to discredit what I'm saying to defend people who have a similar past. The hypocrisy is on you, not on me, because I'm calling it all out. I ain't leaving my own past out. I have been honest with it, and I am telling you all the honest truth of mine. He helped with my education. Really? Did he help with your education? Or did you grow past it because you found somebody better and you just can't accept that you found something better because you want to be civil? Fuck your civility. Fuck your civility. The Cambridge Project ran for a total of five years. As time would prove, the kids were right to fear it. And that comrades and friends is the end of chapter two 